Okay, so we're about five minutes in, uh, and uh, it's a good time to to start up. Um, so I'm very excited and honored to introduce Gail Kaiser, who is a professor of computer science in the computer science department at Columbia University. Um, she received her PhD from CMU, her BS from MIT, and she's done amazing work in software engineering and security from a systems perspective with a focus on program analysis, both the static and dynamic variety and software testing. Uh, uh, in the 80s and early 90s, um, she investigated uh, technologies that were the forerunners to today's IDEs and continuous integration. In the mid 90s to the early 2000s, she investigated technologies leveraging the nascent World Wide Web and self adaptation for the then emerging cloud computing, particularly techniques for retrofitting legacy software. Uh, around mid 2000, uh, during her sabbatical at Columbia Center for Computational Learning Systems, she became one of the first people to investigate software engineering testing techniques for finding bugs in machine learning software. Uh, or coming to her more recent work uh, on static and dynamic program analysis techniques for both source code and binaries, and, and more uh, closely to um, her contemporary, her current work, she's been investigating secure computing paradigms and machine learning techniques for solving software engineering problems. And so, um, uh, Gail, uh, very excited to hear your talk um, and feel free to take over when you're ready. Okay. Um, I didn't realize that that bio was intended to be read aloud. I would have given you a much shorter one if, if I had known that. Okay. Um, I assumed it was just printed somewhere. Okay, anyway, uh, my title here, nearly 40 years of SE and AI. Basically, I started doing some AI um, in uh, summer of actually 86, by, uh, which is about a year after I started at Columbia. But I just recently got my uh, welcome to Triple AI, which is sort of funny. Uh, but if you look at uh, the details, they have my membership drawing date correctly. So I'm not completely sure why they just sent me a welcome, but I just got it. So I've had a very long uh, uh, interaction with AI that uh, was just acknowledged uh, that this is actually, of course, an error. I signed up to join AAA AI because I wanted a discount on some workshop that I was attending. Okay, anyway, in the 1980s, and we're talking about you know some sort of old AI concepts, at least initially here, in the 1980s, AI looked like this. Basically, this is rules, all right? There's an if part. When this is true, then the then part happens. An if part, and then the then part happens. You know, it looks like if-then-else statements. Well, that was AI in the 1980s and actually into the 1990s. This was uh, the, uh, from I took this from the classic paper 20 years later, the AAAI chose. And this is a symbolic list machine. This was where you wrote your expert systems in those days, a machine of that nature. Okay, so AI looks sort of like that. And AI also looks sort of like this. This is some more rules, but these rules, unlike uh, instead of coming from John McDermott's work, this is from, from my work, um, or some very early work. And these rules, if you don't need to read them very carefully, but what they're basically doing is, is an, a rule-based or rules that look like the kind of rules that existed in AI systems that in those days, but it essentially implements something very similar to make if you looked at it carefully, okay? And what we wanted to do at that time was apply expert systems, which were really hot at the time. Expert systems was the way things went. That was AI in, in the 80s. And we wanted to apply it to software development. So there were some issues to we considered. One was sort of the granularity of applying it. And today, you know about AI applying things at the level of you know tokens, for example. Well, that was not very practical on the kinds of equipment that we had available at the time, uh, with Vax 11, 780s and 750s, which are about as intelligent as your chair um, in terms of you know the amount of memory and computation and so forth. So basically we had rules about modules and procedures, not about at the statement or token level. 
we wanted to deal with um, rule bases that changed or could change over time, which was actually not a common thing in expert systems at that point. They could add additional rules, but not usually on the fly. So this was something special we wanted to do for the software engineering context. And we also had a situation where we might have multiple developers working on the same code base at the same time who had actually different sets of rules and that could be potentially conflicts. I'll talk a little bit about some of these issues. Um, our system that we originally developed uh, starting in 86 was named Marvel. It was named after the uh, Kansas version of the Wizard of Oz, which I was, I was a big Wizard of Oz fan in those days. Um, and this is from the uh, the abstract from the paper. I don't really expect you to read this, this text, but I'll just read a part of it. Um, our model is unique in that it consists primarily of rules that define the preconditions and multiple postconditions of software development activities. Our most significant contribution is opportunistic processing, whereby the environment performs software development activities through controlled automation. This is accomplished by a forward and backward chaining interpretation of the rule set. So AI in those days was basically chaining over a rule set, forward and or backward, and we were doing, you know, AI for software engineering, okay? And I know this doesn't look like AI now, but it was AI at the time, okay? We could generate, oops, generate a Marvel environment by defining a, uh, what we call the strategy. It's basically a rule base or rule set. And we defined a particular set of objects that are lived in our object base, which was essentially a mapping onto the Unix file system. And we had a particular strategy that were in use for particular users uh, to pick particular development projects. And developers on the same project would probably use the same rules, but they might share a code base with other people doing somewhat different work. And we did have a, eventually, not initially, that was single user, but very soon we had a multi-user system with different users doing different things. And, and running a Marvel environment, I'm not going to talk about the you know, details of Marvel. This is really, really ancient history. But to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we did for incorporating expert system kind of technology in a software engineering environment, we had you know, our representation of the program that was being developed. Okay, And we had an internal representation of the rules that supported backward and forward chaining across the rule base. Okay. And this was fairly typical of the AI expert systems at the time, except we had both board, backward and forward chaining in the same system, okay. depending on what happened. So for example, this is, this is very simple examples, but let's say you wanted to edit some piece of the code. Uh, you would edit it. That would uh, change the timestamp. So now it would need to recompile. So once you finished editing and you check it in, it would automatically recompile it for you. You know, what today is called continuous integration, but at the time we, we were using rules to implement it. Okay. And we had, you know, what I was mentioning before, having conflicts potentially between the rules or just even within a set of rules where we had multiple people running the same rules and they had, they were running, accessing the same objects in some, many cases. And they could potentially run into conflicts with my the chaining that I'm triggering affecting the chaining that you're triggering and vice versa. So here we got a situation where we have two developers and you know Bob here wants to test some code. And at the same time, this other developer, Mary, is also wanting to do some testing and that's fine. They start their testing. And the condition of this test was basically that the code was up to date, everything was compiled and so forth. And this Bob starts also testing, but discovers a problem, wants to modify the code. And that actual, and that means they have to reserve the code and start editing. And this actually breaks the condition that enabled Mari to start testing in the first place. But this is all happening simultaneously. And we have some you know, forward chaining going on and we have some backward chaining in the same system. And we had to deal with conflicts. And in this particular case, what actually happened would define on how it was defined in the particular rule base. But generally speaking, since Mary was already doing her testing, she would be allowed to continue. And this, you know, that would, you know, nothing would, she would not actually see the new version of this 
code until later on. So she would continue with that version. Another strategy that we could have had would have notified Mary, oh, there's a conflict now. Do you really want to continue? Somebody's at changing this code and they might decide not to, okay? And it really depended on what you put in your, in your strategies, your set of rules. Okay, I want to say a little bit about retroactive continuity. I already mentioned the concept, context, concept sorry, of continuous integration or CI. Well, we implemented it with the Marvel environment, but it actually hadn't been invented yet, um, or the term had not been invented yet. I think that was from Grady Booch in around 91. But we were already using a system called Smile that was not particularly an AI system, but we were just using it internally developed software. And I later used it, brought it with me to Columbia, and we developed um, Marvel using it. But I just want to mention that this was already continuous integration was not invented by Grady Booch in 1991. We were using, I don't know who invented it, but we were using it in 1980. So, um, and automatically rebuilding the executables whenever code was checked in, okay? Our initial Marvel prototype was basically re-implementing this small environment that it was hard-coded. It was just a local homegrown system, um, you know, not, not a really exciting system. It just did our work you know, a lot of our work for us. And we were, but implementing it, quote, using AI or using an expert system with rules. Uh, today, environments like Marvel called software development environments would be known as integrated development environments or IDEs. And what we called at the time envelopes, which was a way of integrating existing tools, you know, the compiler, the editor, you know, uh, uh, Lint, um, whatever else that we were using would also would be the equivalent of IDE plug plugins, and we just you know, referred to them as envelopes at the time. Okay, um, this project, so I'm not going to really talk about it anymore. It was very uh, basic notion of AI. Went on for a long time, about a dozen years. We started it in '86. This is a picture of some of the manuals. I still have some of the physical manuals that we had. Um, I just. I recently actually found these lying around in my office, so I took a photo of a bunch of them. We actually had real, you know, a fairly big system with actual some external users. We were licensing it outside of Columbia at a time when Columbia didn't really know how to do software licensing. They mostly did medical device licensing. Um, you know, they mostly was up to the medical school or they had some other kind of like a patent that they would license. Uh, software was different. But they now they now definitely have the hang of it. Um, we had our first work in 1986. Um, we were building a real, real system. By 1990, we were eating our own dog food in the sense of the mar soft source code for our Marvel system was all inside Marvel object base, and the whole system was entirely self-supporting. Um, we took a while before we had full multi-user support in the sense of that conflict detection really working, um, but it did eventually really work. And then we had another few years. So this went on for about a dozen years. I wonder, I intended, okay, this is not gonna work. I don't know if you can hear that on the other end. Meaning we're not in Kansas anymore. Okay. Anyway. Yes, we can hear it. <laughs> yeah. I threw this in. Rainbow. And it's very short. It should end. Yes, right now. Okay. Anyway, this project went on for a long time. And I was a big fan of um, Wizard of Oz. So that's where this naming scheme came from. And we had on, you know, built the initial system, had, we're using it internally, we had external users. I think we actually had about 25 licensees. Those were organizations, not individual users. Um, we eventually built a system called Oz instead of Marvel, which was the sort of the bigger distributed, you know, grown up version of, of Marvel that supported network workstations. Our original system was just working on a, a Unix quote mainframe, which at the time was known as a mini computer. And we built uh, Oz as a distributed system. We eventually supported offline access, sort of like a Google Docs now, where you could be disconnected, do some work, um, connect up to the internet again, and everything sort of, uh, you basically propagate the changes you made locally into the shared um, shared world and need to you know, potentially update it. 
We eventually built a system we called OzWeb, which took advantage of the new World Wide Web, which is becoming very popular at around this time, and uh, where we were running the user interface for our Marvel slash Oz system in a browser. We eventually had a fourth PhD thesis out of this, and 1998, we finally called it a day and uh, started doing um, something else, but this project went on for a very long time. Um, building ex you know, expert systems for software engineering as expert systems existed at that time. Okay, so that's the first part of this talk. Um, I'm going to fast forward now from 1980s, early 90s, or actually I guess late 90s, or the tail end of Marvel, to the early 2000s, when AI started to look like this, as a, da you know, a data set, all right? This is some data, it's not supposed to have any particular meaning. These are our labels, okay? But AI started to look like more or less what we'd expect today, except it was um, programmed in code, not in neural nets, which I'll get to shortly. This is another, or actually two data sets that actually uh, were samples from something we were testing. And what made this different, this was a sort of a archetype is we had missing values and we could potentially have repeated values, the same value appear multiple times in the same row or in the same column. And a lot of the early uh, techniques for you know algorithms for doing machine learning on um, these data sets didn't really deal with that very well. I started working in, um, See, 2005, because it was 2005, 2006 was my sabbatical at a place called CCLS, Columbia Center for um, Computational Learning Systems. And they were doing a lot of work, not surprisingly, and it's called, given they're called computational learning systems with machine learning. And I did a project I particularly joined with something that was concerned with the power grid in New York City. And in particular, one of the things we did, they we did with it is um, use machine learning for decision support for um, feeder susceptibility. What this means is they were trying to do preventative maintenance on the feeders, uh, the electrical feeders that supported the lighting, you know, electricity in New York City. And they could look at what, which feeders were predicted by the machine learning to be most likely to fail. And then those would be the ones that they would, you know, choose for uh, preventative maintenance. Okay, or at least that was the theory behind it. But the idea was it was really supposed to work. Okay, so what we had here is real-world ML software in the sense of that a certain electrical company, which at the time we weren't allowed to tell people, but now we can. It's Con Edison. I don't know what they would have thought else we would do. Is Con Edison is the New York City electrical. Company, so I don't know who else they would have imagined, but we weren't supposed to say Con Ed back then. Um, they were supporting this work. They were really using the machine learning software developed by CCLS in their uh, feeder maintenance program. But we had a lot of troubles trying to deal with um, the Con Ed data. And I had a lot of trouble actually trying to deal with working at CCLS. Um, myself and actually one of my uh, PhD students were actually, was there with me also on my sabbatical. Um, dealing with you know all these machine learning people who did not speak the same language as us who were software engineering people. In particular, one of the simplest one was what does testing mean? For AI people, testing is what you do to determine, you know, you've, you've, uh, you've uh, trained it, you get some training results, and then you do testing with a holdout data set and you find out what your accuracy is and your recall and precision and so forth. But, Testing had to do with finding accuracy, had nothing to do with finding bugs in the sense that software engineering people mean. So when I said testing, they would hear something about accuracy when I was talking about, I, I suppose it did impact accuracy, but I was thinking about bugs in the software. So we had some difficulties with that. Another problem with dealing with finding bugs in this machine learning software was there was no test oracle. And this is a big issue from a software engineering perspective, which is, was what, um, Davis and Weyerkert called non-testable programs. Programs which were written in order to determine the answer in the first place. There would be no need to write such programs if the correct answer was no. So if we knew ahead of time, if people at Con Ed knew ahead of time 
what is the next feeder to fail? Which one's going to fail? And that's the one we should go to our preventive maintenance on, you know, tomorrow. Well, we didn't know what was going to be the next feeder to fail. That, so there was no oracle that could tell us what was the next feeder to fail, unless you wait into the future, but then it's too late. Um, we also had problems that some of the real world data in the data sets, which by the way, were hum absolutely humongous data sets. Um, we, they had to be moved around by um, sneaker net. You had to carry it with you. Um, real world data, some of it was very old. Some of the earliest feeders were still on the ground from the 1930s. Actually, there was one from 1911, I was told, but I don't know if we ever actually did anything with the 1911 feeder. Um, there was many missing attributes. We can't, you can't fill them in retroactively, but you don't want to fill them in with defaults because they may have actually really mattered, okay, what the value was. So you don't want two values to be the same when they really shouldn't have been. Uh, another fun thing was categorical data was often represented by numerical values. So like years were a very common thing. What year was a feeder put in the ground? But you can't really treat 1940 versus 1970 as um, numerical values. I guess you could in the sense of, oh, maybe you could imagine that a 1940 feeder might be more likely to fail than a 1970 feeder because it's uh, older. Although, as it turned out, exactly the opposite was true. That the older, longer it had successfully stayed in the ground without being replaced, the more um, reliable it was. So the older it was, the general, the better, except for the various newest ones. And then what the ML was supposed to do was not the usual sort of classification kind of problem that was big um, in the you know, early 2000s with respect to AI, but it was a ranking problem because you wanted to rank the propensity of the feeders to fail they'll all eventually fail. So classification is yes, no, is not terribly helpful. Um, and you would like to get the right answers because this was really being used to determine the maintenance, uh, which ones to maintain. And maintenance was incredibly expensive because you had to go dig up the streets that the feeders in Manhattan are, and uh, Queens and uh, Bronx and Brooklyn are all underground. Staten Island's the only uh, borough that has above ground um, feeders, um, you know, telephone poles. Um, so very, very expensive. And you also wanted to get the right ones uh, fixed first because timeout, you know, sorry, blackouts in New York City can have extreme consequences like, you know, people die when uh, the traffic lights don't work and things like that. So um, very important to get it right. Okay, software testing techniques. I was basically hired to do my you know, sabbatical by Dave Walsh, the director of CCLS, who wanted the software to really work in the software engineering sense. And the software was conveniently, you know, the old kind of ML algorithms in the sense of it was written as code. It was not, there was no neural networks at the time in the, in the early 2000s. And it was written with programs like the um, support vector machines and decision trees and a variety of other techniques that were written in regular code in some programming language. So they exhibited the conventional kinds of bugs that software engineering people, software testing people see all the time off by one. Unstable sorting was particularly common. There was an awful lot of uh, sorting in these algorithms and they often did it not quite right. Um, so this kind of software was amenable to conventional software testing with data, small data sets. So we could have a partial oracle, even though there was still no test oracle for the whole thing in terms of saying, what is the next feeder that's going to, you know, what, what should we get is the answer. Um, it was also amenable to runtime assertion checking. There was a tool at the time called Daikon that would automatically generate invariants for certain software. We took advantage of it as, as a, you know, to try to see if that would help. We also used differential testing because uh, CCL CCLS conveniently had three implementations of this tool called Marty Rank, which used something called Martingale Bur boosting in a ranking form um, in order to rank the feeders. But then what happened is we learned, we, and we came up with several things. We, the first couple papers we published on this work um, were based on testing with just sort of conventional software engineering kinds of techniques. But then we learned about metamorphic testing which I had not known about earlier. It was relatively obscure at the time, but it turned out to actually really help a lot, okay? Um, and in particular, what metamorphic testing was, and still is, I guess, um, is you have some test case 
wherever you got it from. It doesn't really matter. It could be, you know, arbitrary random data. It could be something you from a partial oracle, you know, from a assertion checking, whatever. You've got some existing input, you ran some code, you got the output. Okay. And the way metamorphic testing works is you generate a new input from your original input. You run your program again and you get a new result that is with this new input. And then you're comparing the uh, original output to the new output. This is sort of basically a form of pseudo oracle. Okay. And basically if it's not as expected, if you had some expected value for this function that you applied to the derived input, um, you would know that there was a kind of error, okay? But if, so if they didn't match or if they were not as expected, you knew there was some kind of error. You didn't know necessarily what it was because you don't know, you don't necessarily know that f of x was right in the first place or whether f of t of x was right in the first place. But if they're inconsistent with each other, you know there's some kind of bug. That's the basic gist of metamorphic testing, okay? And if it is correct, though, it is, or in the sense of it, the correct value, the value you expected, that doesn't mean it's truly the correct answer. It means you just haven't, you know, found the problem yet. Okay. Right. So here's some examples of metamorphic properties that we came up with for this specific algorithm. The details of the algorithm aren't important. It's just um, a ranking algorithm for finding the, the uh, propensity of feeders to fail. And this would, these kinds of properties would apply to actually quite a few of the AI applications at that time, because you were dealing with data sets that were essentially tables of elements, and each row was another element. So we have properties like additive. If you add another element to the data set, the final ranking should be unchanged, except for the new element that you've added, obviously appears there somewhere, but all the old elements stay in the same order. Oops, sorry, that, I just said that wrong. That's actually the inclusive one, adding one. Additive is actually adding a value to the, each element of the data set. There, there's a, some integer in there, you add one. You haven't changed the final ranking. Multiplicative, multiplicative is uh, multiplying each value. You, similarly, every, with, you go down a row, you, um, or actually down a column, you multiply each value of a particular attribute, you, and you now redo the algorithm, you should still get the same order, right? same ranking. Permutative, if you change the order of this data set, the final ranking should still be the same, even though you put in the different values in a different order. Uh, if you uh, negate all the values, you should get the same final ranking, but in the reverse order. And then inclusive was, and exclusive was what I accidentally said at the beginning, is when you're adding an element and removing an element, uh, you should still get the same order, except for you now have you know one more or one less. Okay, all right. And metamorphic testing was, and that by the way, in that exact same set of uh, properties, those six properties apply to actually it turns out many machine learning problems of that era, because you when you were trying to work in terms of classifiers or rankers, um, and you were using actual code, you would get uh, you could compare the answers and see oh we add one more. Uh, element, we remove an element, did we change something? Surprisingly often, if there was a bug, it would, okay? And basically metamorphic testing relies on having metamorphic properties that define, you know, a function for deriving a new input from the old input, you know, which is like, you know, additive or inverted or whatever. Function for deriving the expected new output from the old input, the old output, and then, you know, how you actually went about deriving the new input. And then a function for doing the comparison because it was not necessarily equality. It could be, you know, same, same order or a consistent order or reverse order. Okay. Um, metamorphic properties or metamorphic testing is often sort of described in a very strange way, um, like uh, that the new output should always be equal to or identical to the old output. That's not true at all. At the main point, is it was supposed to be predictable which is why that as long as you could predict the answer from correctly and it came out exactly as you were predicted or semantically equivalent to what you predicted, or even if there's a, a range of values that's statistically equivalent to what you predicted, that's good. And if it, you know, any of those things are violated, then you know, you know you have some kind of error. All right, so we applied metamorphic testing to a bunch of what, you know, 
could be viewed as non-testable programs. We had a, a, several machine learning programs. Um, you know, C4.5 is a decision tree and probably all heard know about support vector machines. Marty Rank was this thing that uh, CCLS specifically developed and Pale was something actually developed at Columbia by a completely different group that was concerned with anomaly detection, uh, Cal Sopo's book. And we also looked at some other kinds of situations that were essentially non-testable programs. You know, simulators, you don't necessarily know ahead of time what exactly the simulation ought to be as an output, so it's non-testable. Um, you know, search engines, you don't necessarily have exactly the right answer. And even certain kinds of optimization um, are so expensive to compute a test or, you know, a complete oracle that you don't often have an oracle. Okay, so we applied it to a bunch of pro programs with the same kinds of um, metamorphic properties that I just showed you. And we found that we compared it to partial oracles and runtime assertion checking. And we found that metamorphic testing in general did pretty well. It didn't necessarily do the best in each case, it did the best on Marty Rank, which is the one we were initially concerned about since that was what was used by the uh, Con Ed feeders. But it also you know, worked pretty well, a few others. Did not work so well with Pale, and actually not so well with Capitor either. Um, and that was because we did not have, or we couldn't come up with, I guess we weren't smart enough, didn't come up with enough metamorphic properties for the Pale application. And well, your feeder wasn't too bad, but with Pale, we just weren't able to think of too many metamorphic properties that applied at the full program level, at the input to the whole program and the output of the whole program being a machine learning program in this case. Um, so what we also we also developed was something called mon metamorphic runtime checking, which is essentially dealing with the fact that metamorphic testing does not have to be applied to whole programs or to whole machine learning algorithm. It could also apply to individual functions inside the code, which was useful when you only knew a few metamorphic properties at the full application level, but you could think of some more for some of the functions that were inside the code for individual functions. Um, and we ran this metamorphic runtime checking, essentially like unit testing, except we ran it in the context of the whole application so we could deal with the whole application state. Okay. So metamorphic runtime checking was essentially you know, the same kind of thing as um, metamorphic testing, except in this case, you were running it on individual functions inside the code base. So as the code runs, you happen to call some function f, it happens to have particular parameters, you're running it, you just continue with it running, but you also at the same time fork a sandbox in order to run a test, you generate a new input for that function, you execute just that function, and you compare the output to the output of that specific internal function inside the code as the program continues running. So this gave us a way of checking metamorphic properties of individual functions, okay? And this added, to what we could find. So with the original metamorphic testing, we sometimes found certain problems and if MRC might find others, but in some cases they would find things that weren't found at all by metamorphic testing that particularly worked with PAL. So basically we got, by considering both at the whole program level and at the individual function level, we managed to find basically more bugs, okay? And again, this was all AI that was written, AI algorithms or machine learning algorithms that were written as code. So a lot of times the code was, you know, C, C++ or whatever. And then this is, the, you know, MT and MC put together and we could now, in still some cases, other techniques did better, but we actually did on average, did more than with metamorphic testing on uh, testing AI software than we'd done without it. Okay, using what other techniques were available. Okay. So that's basically the gist of the um, AI work I did in the early 2000s, sort of the middle period, in the sense that here we were not applying AI to a problem so much as we were trying to apply software engineering to AI. We were trying to find bugs in the underlying AI. Now we're in the 2020s, okay? So this is up to, for fast forwarding to our current time. And today's AI, well, you all know, you know, we have these huge models with zillions of parameters. We have um, uh, software, AI software that will chat with you and, you know, say whatever. Um, 
but people are also using AI to analyze software. Okay. So now we're back to the software engineering problem, but using AI or using machine learning and, and generative AI to help with software engineering. Okay. So, you know, here's a picture of, you know, using the transformer to manage code. And in particular, what we're trying to do with this code in this particular case is determine branching. We look at this particular, we've learned all this stuff about source code. We've learned about executions. Um, and we would like to find out uh, which branches were actually taken. So this is a you know a reasonable software engineering kind of problem. And our particular technique that we're using and that I'll talk about um, as part of this part of the talk is in comparison to other techniques that are used with code language models, we were able to do much better with this branch prediction problem. And as it turns out also with several other software engineering tasks, than some of the you know best code language models that had existed prior to that point, you know like Unix Coder and Codex, and we also you will see shortly we compared to some other ones, and the big difference was that our part of our input that we're recording was not just the source code, but we were actually inputting the uh, some inputs, and we we're actually running the program and keeping a trace of the program. And using the trace as part of the input that is, you know, part of the data set for learning purposes. Okay. So um, the challenges now to applying machine learning to software development. I started with the challenges way back when of expert systems, applying that to software development. Now we're trying to apply today's modern machine learning to software development. And we are, instead of working at the granularity of whole modules, files basically and whole procedures. We could actually consider tokens, variable statements, you know, much finer granularity. Um, we are concerned with changing the model, which I'm sure you all know about, you know, differences between tree training, fine tuning prompt engineering. We are mostly advocating pre training for the purpose of adding these execution traces and then fine tuning without them. But you could also take an existing pre trained model and fine tune with the execution traces. Um, we have just started trying to get this to work with prompt engineering and frankly, it doesn't work quite yet. Um, in fact, it may never work. We haven't been able to get that uh, happy. Um, one thing that changed about the interaction between software engineering and AI people or, or machine learning people is that machine learning people do now recognize that their AI generates buggy code and you know there can be bugs. Um, and they're even doing work on generating AI, you know, using generative AI to generate test suites for conventional code. And there are actually test oracles available for many of the code data sets and software engineering tasks are used by researchers. Although of course not in the general case of using AI to generate code. Okay. So here's an example of using something like this to um, use machine learning to uh, where you actually care about the branching and uh, actually runtime values and the execution traces. So let's say we have our developer here and they're using pick your favorite AI copilot, okay? Um, or AI assistant that helps you with the coding. And this developer has written you know, this trivial program that's only doing factorial because that's all we could really fit. And we're asking our copilot, hey, is this the secure? This developer knows that integer overflow might happen since it's dealing with large numbers. And well, Copilot's inserted the security check to prevent integer overflow. Those of you who are really looking at this code will probably spot the bug immediately, but a Copilot would not necessarily do that. And that was interesting. I just saw it. I had something black out. But anyway, the developer goes on and decides to run the code and gets this value that can't possibly be right. Okay. Uh, knows that that is, couldn't possibly be the answer. There's some kind of bug here. Okay, so now the developer tries to debug this particular code and discovers, you know, on the 17th time around the loop, we have this really large number. So we're expecting, you know, the security check to kick in, but that branch is not taken. Okay, and we get an overflow. All right, well, the reason it's not taken is because it's already overflowed, but the language model, the copilot that predict, you know, that inserted the security check and predicted that, A, everything's fine, didn't know about variable values, did not know about coverage because 
most language models today, code language models, are trained only on source code. Or they might be trained on natural language descriptions of the code. They might be trained on uh, various representations of the source code in the sense of um, the actual text, the abstract syntax tree, the um, control flow graphs, you know, lots and lots of static representations of the code, but they're not trained on, or at least before we were advocating this, not trained on the actual execution of the code. So our system called TRACED, which stands for Execution Aware Representation Learning for Source Code, um, does actually train the language model, the large language model, with variable values and coverage, okay? So in particular, this kind of thing would not, is supposedly not going to happen. So here we go, we get the same program. We're gonna collect the program states as the program runs. So we're retaining in the execution trace, we're retraining the values as it runs. And this is of course a trivial program, but you know we would be able to do this with somewhat larger programs, although this does not, so far does not scale nicely to huge programs. I wouldn't try this on the Linux kernel unless you can divide it into pieces. But in any case, we collect the program states as the program runs. We record the values that they happen, but we do have to deal with the fact that some of these values are sort of weird. They can be very sparse. They can be relatively complex. They're in large. Well, this particular case, is, we know this one's an error. This one's not too hard. So what we actually do is what actually a lot of work that's now dealing with machine learning and you know values that occur during real program or actually in any, any context where you have a lot of a wide range of numerical values through quantization. So we distinguish basically large and small um, and zero. So large positive, small positive, small negative, large negative and zero. And we map all these into particular cases. So we've got to return, we save that information. And then we tree train our large language model with traces, not just with the source code. So for each program that is that is part of the data set, in addition, you have a set of inputs and a set of corresponding execution traces that match either, each of those inputs. And then when we are doing the training, we're looking at three different um, uh, three different techniques for doing the sort of the fine tuning aspect of it. And one is the standard mass language modeling, where you mask out part of it, you ask it to tell you what's, what was there behind the mass. That's the completely standard that's used in NLP and used in a lot of use of uh, code language models. We also, however, though, trained on uh, coverage, whether it was something was reached or not, and the specific values, or quantized values, actually, um, in terms of the execution traces. And there's a glitch here, but I should fix, but I didn't. Okay. All right, and when you fine tune though, after, down the, after the fact, when you have, after the pre-training with those traces, you can fine tune particular problems like coverage prediction, vulnerability detection and so forth without actually having to do the execution traces all over again, which you know can be very, well, are very expensive. And you still retain that knowledge in the original pre-trained model. Okay? Or at least it's so far that we've discovered that we have in our system. So with respect to predicting runtime behavior, our trace system works pretty well. Here it's particularly applied to Unix coder, and this is uh, significant because trace is actually under the covers essentially the same um, as Unix coder. It uses the same Roberta arch architecture. Um, it starts out with the same initial weight, but we added those execution traces to the to the training, okay, that Unix coder did not have. So otherwise, they're, they're basically equivalent models, except for we have added execution, uh, the execution traces and the corresponding inputs. So for coverage, both determining the full path and specifically individual branches, uh, trace did better. Okay. With respect to the values of variables, again, keeping in mind we're talking about quantized variables, not the actual one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, did much better. Okay. And we also looked, applied it to vulnerability detection, and clone detection, semantic clone detection, for compared to a lot of different code language models. 
okay, including Unix code, but also some other ones that are, uh, these are basically taken from uh, various leaderboards. They were the top ones at the time that we started doing this. And we use the same data sets. These are all standard data sets. And we basically did better, somewhat better, on vulnerability detection on this data set, on this data set, and somewhat better on clone detection. Clone retrieval, sorry, finding the retrieval, finding the same, the semantic clones, um, looking at a set of possibilities, okay? So basically it did better than these alternative code language models. Okay. So finishing up, uh, what happened with Trace is that execution-aware pre-training improved our understanding or the language model's understanding of code semantics compared to the static pre-training. It's not a huge difference yet, although it depends on the data set, as you can see. Some data sets, it's a big, much bigger difference than others. But we are you know, going down the, the road to try to improve that. We are starting to look at applying it to other problems, but right now it's predicting reasonably well execution paths, branch coverage, and, and runtime values. And it essentially improves the code understanding of the downstream tasks without having to do the execution traces you know, again with the data that you're using for fine tuning. And we are just, well, I shouldn't say just starting because we're submitting the paper next week, but we are working on um, execution aware uh, generation, code generation and refinement as well. So this traced, the system I just told you about is answering questions, but it's not actually generating the code. And we're, we got a new system coming out, a new paper that we hope will go in and get accepted that uh, actually is dealing with the code generation refinement, again, based on knowing the execution traces. Okay, so it's time to finish up. And I hope my timing is, is not too far off. Um, I wanted to say a couple of things. One is we start, started out by talking about how we were using AI assistance for software engineering in the context of my uh, Marvel environment way back in the uh, late, starting in the late 80s, or actually 86, I guess that's sort of mid 80s. But AI assistance for software engineering was not new. And in fact, all these co-pilots that you see, you know, that are considered a big deal today, those were not new. Marble was not new. This, these two paragraphs came from a paper written by Terry Winograd in 1973 about a programming model based on uh, AI understanding of what's going on in the code and what's going on in the programming world. And actually, it essentially predicts the kind of thing that we're doing with the execution traces, although that is not where we got the idea. But um, it's a very interesting paper to go back and read. I have a this link to it here because it's predicted an awful lot of the stuff or you know that we have now and probably that we'll have down the road is, is telling us. And then a second parting thought is with respect to finding bugs in AI generated code or just in the AI code, which may be human generated, AI is still buggy and may always be big, buggy, but we think a better understanding of the execution semantics will help with that bugginess and in particular help with debugging it. One thing I like is this phrase. If you look around um, at uh, various user forums for Copilot, and you see similar things for some of the other uh, AI assistance tools, that they sort of this mantra that they have whenever anybody has a essentially files a complaint or says something doesn't work or whatever and posts that on the form. GitHub Copilot does not write perfect code. It's designed to generate the best code possible given the context it has access to, but it doesn't test the code it suggests so the code may not always work or even make sense. I was surprised at how many times I found almost exactly or literally exactly that exact same quote all over the place with respect to anybody talking about GitHub Copilot, okay? And that was sort of strange. Um, and in GitHub themselves, no, you know, or Microsoft who owns GitHub know that you know there are problems, um, and you can find bugs in it and submit make money actually by submitting vulnerabilities. And I just wanted to end by mentioning that uh, AI triple AI's bug that welcomed me only you know uh, thirty eight years later to to triple AI was a bug, and they please said please uh, disregard it. Okay, sent that later the same day. All right, so that's it. All right, thank you very much, Gail. Um, I uh, and we can uh, give a virtual applause over. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> and um, so I don't know if 
anyone at the moment has questions immediately, if if you do, feel free to either type it into chat or unmute and um, ask your question out loud. Uh, if there's no one immediately ready to ask a question, um, I'm, I guess I, I'm a little bit curious about, uh, so at, at least from my understanding, um, it's to, to what extent are, do you think there's some kind of trade-off uh, in terms of, because you're advocating for pre-training versus- Okay, right. This, this, this latest work is we're, as part of the pre-training, we are doing execution traces, but this is the way that we implement it in trace. Potentially, you could also take an already existing pre-trained model and do fine tuning where you're ex adding execution traces. And then after that, do the uh, further fine tuning or prompt engineering to get particular applications. Um, Traced actually works the particular way I described because we're generating the model and I, we have this direct comparison with Unix coder, which was, uh, one problem is everything that happens with LLMs, no matter what you do, somebody else does something that sort of supersedes it, you know, a few days later or something like this. We were using the best systems that were available at the time. I don't think Trace is, but itself has been superseded, but some of the uh, models that we're comparing against have certainly been, you know, improved on over the years, um, over the years, actually over the months, over the weeks, something like that, okay? Um, <clears throat> so we, we, we know that we didn't actually do the whole uh, set up with the whole set of experiments, but we do know that if using it later in the chain could also help. But the point is you don't want to have to keep using it all the way along because it's expensive. Doing execution traces is expensive. It doesn't scale very well. Um, and as you get to larger and larger programs, there's just no way you're going to realistically deal with those execution traces. So what you're hoping is that the execution traces for relatively small pieces of software will train the model enough to understand the semantics so that it can deal with those larger larger pieces of code without having to get the execution traces. But we are right now at the point where we're trying to look at, yes, that's scaling up. And I'll, you know, ask me again in a year or two, uh, the thing uh, about the details. Um, we already, we actually have a paper, we're submitting it to, I believe, NURPS, NURPS next week, or maybe it's the week after, um, where we've done a little bit of this, but it's still, relatively small scale. So it's going to be a while, I think, before we go to a uh, larger scale. And um, maybe we will convince other people along the way to also start looking at the execution-based semantics because um, lots of work just doesn't do that. The only other work, earlier work that I know of that included the execution semantics um, was a system called TREX, which worked at the uh, binary level. Okay, rather than the, we were working at the source code level, but it's still execution, so it's still under the covers of binary. But the guy, the, the main author of the Trex paper is also an author of our trace paper. So it's all part of the same 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 work. Uh, okay, very interesting. Um, thank you, Gail. Uh, so Andre has a question um, I, uh, that he typed into chat. I don't know if he would like to maybe even ask it out loud or- I, I can- uh, I can see it down here. I, I took the liberty of making the chat. I have a another uh, monitor down down below here that I can look at where so I could see the chat text because otherwise I would not be able to see it on the screen there. Um, research is okay. Okay, thank you for your talk. As you said, research is cyclical where we break through, make progress, and plateau, etc. How would you assess where we are with um, Gen AI co-pilot traces today, and what is your outlook for the next five years in this regard? <laughs> At this point, I really hesitate to predict anything five years out because what's going on with the large language models is, um, you know, just a new thing comes out every few weeks. I mean, there's just so, you know, it just seems like that. Um, I think by going in this direction of, of the execution traces, we may have jumped ahead of, of some of the other work with, with code language models. Um, but I don't, I really find it hard to predict. I suspect though, that if we wanted to find, get good guesses as to where it might go is go back and reread uh, Terry Winograd's paper again, which I just recently reread. And it was like, oh my God, he predicted everything, you know? Um, and, and then Terry and Winograd also himself in his own paper had references to earlier people's ideas about these programming assistants. So it wasn't like 73 was the first time 
Um, there was some earlier stuff, even from the, the 60s. Um, I think Marvin Minsky and some other people had done some had some ideas back then. Um, there will certainly be a lot of changes, but one thing I can probably uh, predict is that there's going to be another AI winter <laughs> in that <laughs> somewhere in the middle of this. In fact, I, I didn't actually mention as we went to through the um, um, expert systems to the mo sort of more modern AI is that there was a what's called an AI winner, I guess. Basically, AI fell out of popularity. Expert systems were a big deal in the 80s. Toward by the end of the 90s, and that's, you know, people were didn't really expect that much. They were disillusioned and so forth. Um, and AI was, you know, not, not quite as hot as it had been before. But by, again, the mid-2000s, it was starting to get big again. Um, I think CCLS was one of the earlier uh, organizations to get into really using machine learning as part of real world applications, which is now, of course, you know, becoming ubiquitous. But um, five years from now, um, I think we will have something called chat GPT number one, two, three, four, five or something. Um, I don't know. Um, but I'm not, I suspect there will probably be some disillusionment uh, with all the hallucinations and the buggy code that it produces and so forth. But it may not, it may take more than five years. Okay, or maybe all the world problems will be solved. I, I really can't can't predict, <laughs> but um, I'm not as impressed as some people are with the results of these uh, large language models that are just the chatbot kinds of things, or with you know all the different the similar systems that are coming out from other places, from uh, not just OpenAI but uh, Google and you know all all the other big software companies that have these these systems. They're all very similar. They're all leapfrogging over each other, but none of them are really producing software like that could really, really work. It can help, but I'm challenging them to implement, you know, generate the next version of the Linux kernel this way. Good luck. And it's, it's definitely not happening in five years. And um, if anything like that ever happens, well, it probably won't be in my lifetime, but um, there'll be an AI winner, at least one of them, possibly two in between now and then. So I guess that's my prediction. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, Anything? Uh, yes, another question has has popped into chat. <laughs> okay, let me get to um, For the first project you... Oh, okay, good. Why did we leave the first first talk, I mean, sorry, the first project that we I mentioned in the talk. So, um, actually, well, it was, yeah, it's going to take, it's going to be too complicated. Never mind. I'm going to try to go back, but no, I, that's going to be too complicated to do without dropping out of the um, uh, full screen. And it was so incredibly difficult to get it to full screen. I don't want to actually do that again. Uh, Josh knows, yeah, a couple others know what I'm talking about. Um, what made me, what have made us move on? Money. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a, uh, towards the, the last bit of the Marvel Oz sequence, um, actually what, what moved us from Marvel to Oz was actually getting an infusion of, of money from DARPA. Okay. So I had big, what were relatively big bucks at that time from DARPA to work on Oz. And then at, we, we got to a certain point and my DARPA program manager said, I want you to do this other thing which was actually sort of self-sealing systems for uh, what was what would be soon be called cloud computing, but I don't think was quite called that yet in the late 90s. And that's what we started doing. So we moved on because the money went over here and we followed it, okay? And that particular work didn't, I, calling, I mean, it was called self-healing, but it was not AI, okay? It was just doing something automatically. Uh, so um, we have a few more minutes uh, for questions. If no one else has a question, I have a question that I want to ask. Does anyone else have a question at the moment? Okay. Okay. So um, actually, right before your talk start started, NSF was sending out emails about the NAIRR pilot project showcase. Um, for those I wasn't of you reading email during my talk, if you okay. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, right before the talk. And, and so um, I've been looking at this for a while, and it's been very interesting because as um, as um, I'm sure, Gail, you're, you're very much aware of and lots of people in the room are, 
Um, in terms of like hardware, resources, ability to buy GPUs, um, even data sets for sure, uh, industry has been very dominant and in control of all of that. Um, it, in the AI space, and to some extent, that's also pretty true for software as well. Um, and so that whole pilot, the whole point is uh, bringing together federal agencies, many companies to um, uh, share their data sets, have access to cloud computing resources, all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know how successful that, that's going to be, how much that's going to really allow um, academic researchers to participate to a significant level. I know there's a lot of worry about that in AI. There's been a lot of worry, I think, about that in software. And I'm curious to hear your per per perspective on that, Gail. Oh, the industry <laughs> going into this? Actually, this in some ways is, that, is going back to answering the question from a moment ago, which is why do we stop working on it? The reason the money moved is because industry was coming in. This, at the time that we stopped working on Oz, well, first off, it was a good stopping point. We finally built one that was on, ran over the web. It was completely distri worldwide distributed in, in principle. Um, and, you know, it, the money was drying up for that kind of work and industry was really starting to do it. This is when the first real IDE started coming out, you know, like Eclipse, for example, okay? And there really wasn't a need to do this in academia anymore. And then, you know, we moved on to other work, but I think what's going on now is industry sort of, and oh, and with respect to the uh, ML stuff in the mid 2000s, that was still, that was academic industry partner, but I think Con Ed was really far ahead of the time in that they were willing to consider using ML at a time when I don't think many organizations would have trusted the immense cost of digging up a feeder <laughs> to some AI program. I really don't think so. I mean, this was just some, you know, first off, well, David Walsh, who is, a, um, um, he's a, um, unfortunately deceased now, but he he had a great reputation. He was able to bring in big bucks from places like Con Edison. So Con Edison was one of the, you know, uh, first companies to do it. Today, as you know, there's all kinds of software companies that are in on this. They're all doing some new AI, something or other. And that makes it a lot harder in academia because we do not have 1024 GPU machines. You know, we don't have a way of training these uh, billions and billions of parameters, you know, um, or trillions. Or what, I, I don't know if any ones are out for trillions yet, but I bet they will be real soon if they're not already. Um, you know, the academia by itself just isn't going to do this. So there's, you know, academic industry partnerships, and there's a lot of centers being set up where industry is putting in money, but they have an academic presence and stuff. But yeah, this is a huge change um, in terms of what academics who don't have access to these uh, industry resources can do is, you know, smaller scale things like our, our trace system, you know, it is built on a multi-billion uh, parameter system, but it's still the single digits of billions as opposed to pushing up towards trillions, you know. Um, and we will hopefully have an opportunity to try Traced on much bigger ones. In fact, the lead uh, author of the Trace work, a PhD student, is at Google Brain this summer and is hoping to get the opportunity to try it with you know, their re you know, Google scale resources, which is about as good as you can get. So, um, you know, we'll see, but it will be that kind of cooperation, I think that will get us down the road because I, academia by itself is just, can do certain kinds of things, but with respect to this kind of work, I don't I don't see, I see how they're gonna do it all, all by themselves anymore. Got it, got it. All right, um, so, uh... I'd like to thank Gail again for the for the wonderful, very exciting talk. Um, uh, thank you all for for sticking around, especially this long. And uh, uh, um, I'm give a I'm giving it a round of applause at least for Gail one more time. And uh, uh, thank yeah, you very much for inviting me. By the way, yes. Yeah. Oh, definitely our pleasure. And uh, um, thank you all very much again. Bye bye. Bye bye.